good. Call this meeting to order of the Bucks County Commissioners, January 5th, 2022 meeting, and ask that we begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance. Although we don't normally do this, um, I'd like to just give a moment for each row officer to introduce themselves and um, say which row you are holding, because you'll notice there are new faces here today. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Dan McPhillips, and I'm a Bus County Recorder of Deeds. Good morning. And, uh, looking forward to working with everyone today. Good morning, I am Colleen Christian, and I'm your new prothonotary, and also looking forward to working with everybody. Good morning, my name is Pamela Van Blunk. I am the county controller, and I've already begun to work with each one of you, but I continue to, uh, I look forward to continue to do so. Good morning, Fred Heron, I'm uh, the sheriff, and um, uh, I should just say I look forward to working with everybody, but uh, <laughs> it seems like I've been working with everybody for years already, so this is just a continuation. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Good morning, everyone. I'm Chris Ballerini. I'm the treasurer, and I serve as the director of the Tax Claim Bureau. Good morning, Linda Bobber, and Register of Wills, Clerk of Orphans Court. Good morning, everyone. Meredith Buck, County Coroner, and Happy New Year. Good morning, everybody. Matt Weintraub, Bucks County DA. Happy New Year, everybody. Thank you, everyone. So we'll begin with the nomination of the election of chair, vice chair, and secretary. And I'd like to begin by nominating Commissioner Robert Harvey as chair of the Bucks County Commissioners. Is there a second? I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. Okay. Oh, nice. Okay. <clears throat> I guess we have probably to switch these two. I don't know. You've got to do vice chairs. Okay. Okay, at this time, uh, Chair will entertain. First off, thank you to Commissioners Marseglia and DiGeralmo. I appreciate the uh, trust you've put in me. And I thank Commissioner Marseglia for her uh, playing a role as chair for the past two years. Um, and our chair, I'll entertain a motion for vice chair for uh, the Bucks County Board of Commissioners for 2022. And I'll nominate Diane Merseglia as vice chair. I'll second. Uh, motion made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Chair will also entertain a motion for secretary of the Bucks County Commissioners. I would like to nominate uh, Commissioner Jean DiGeralmo as secretary of the Board of Commissioners. I will second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Abstain? I'd like to congratulate both of you, and uh, uh, to, since you changed this year, just let you know that I'm available to be chairman next year. If you, <laughs> <laughs> right, so maybe we'll do rock paper scissors and figure out. <laughs> okay, um, we have a presentation um, this morning, uh, and I do see that our guest has arrived. Um, in July, Bucks County Community College welcomed a new uh, president of the community college, Dr. Felicia Ganther, who comes a pretty long way uh, to join us here uh, from Arizona uh, back in uh, the summertime. But, uh, and now, you know, is joining us today. And you have a presentation. So first off, thank you for joining us, Dr. Ganther. Thank you. And we're excited to allow you to introduce yourself to the people here and to the county, people who haven't met you yet, and talk a little bit about your, your vision for the, count, for the community college. Well, I want to say good morning to everyone. Um, I had a very eventful trip up here. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was the march of all of the trucks uh, up and down Swamp Road. But nevertheless, I'm very excited to be here, and thank you very much for inviting me now, Mr. Chairman Harvey, uh, and to the commissioners. Uh, it's truly an exciting time for Bucks County Community College. I think all of us uh, have had um, COVID, 
pandemic fatigue, and now we're going to have a reintroduction and re-engagement with COVID fatigue. However, um, I'm bringing all of that sunshine from Phoenix here, <laughs> even though it's supposed to snow on Friday, right? But uh, bringing uh, excitement and uh, rejuvenation around Bucks County Community College, and uh, I will tell you that uh, I'm not new to the show. Um, I like to tell people I'm around 25 years of age, uh, which means that I started at birth uh, working in colleges and, uh, colleges and community colleges and universities across the United States. So uh, with 25 years, you can go to the next slide, with 25 years of uh, uh, work in higher education, I feel that it has aptly prepared me to be a partner in this community uh, to support not only the young folks who are coming up through high school, but anyone who needs to be re-careered, who wants to make a better living wage, who has a dream or a goal, or more importantly, who wants to do something different, something exciting. And so I thought it was important. I don't, I don't know when the last time a, a president from Bucks County Community College has spoke to you, but I figured I'd take just a couple of seconds just to share with you what we do. We have over 65,000 students who are in our non-credit programs. That's a lot. That's a lot of uh, residents uh, in the county of Bucks who are taking advantage of that. Now, that's like zero to 99 years of age, right? Our kids' programs, our uh, programs that we have for the 50, 55, and up uh, areas, those are for our senior citizens, as well as uh, our uh, re-careering or uh, uh, incarcerated individuals. We also have about 6,000 students. Now, understand this. My challenge is that in 2011, we had double that number of students that were on our campuses, right? So my, my uh, uh, goal is to get us back into those numbers, right? Because if we have an educated citizenry, then we also have, what, better living for everybody. And so my goal is for us to get up into 10,000 to 12,000 students annually. We also have uh, 29 high school dual enrollment programs. Um, as you can imagine, I have been quite busy meeting with superintendents. Uh, my goal is to have every single high school in this county to have a dual enrollment program. Why? Because it gives a student an opportunity to say that I have college credit coming out of high school. I built a program in Arizona where I've graduated high school students with an associate's degree before they walk across the stage with their high school diploma. So we can do that for our students here. And we do that again through these uh, 42 transfer programs, 22 occupational programs, and 27 certificate programs. So we have breadth and depth at the institution. And so I'm, I'm looking at you because, you know, I can't see your faces. I see your eyes. So I, I'm looking over here and I'm feeling a, wow, I didn't know that, right? So I'm excited to share with you. Next screen. And so, next slide. This is really what, Bucks County Community College is. We have something for everyone. Thousands of options. We're affordable and convenient. We have three campus locations. And for all of you that don't know, we are the number one online college in Pennsylvania. So when you go out today, please tell somebody these four things and tell them we're open for registration. Next slide, please. Um, what you may not know is that we do have a new building um, as a part of the, the uh, building capital for the state, we have an opportunity to uh, put in bids uh, in order for the state to provide us funding to uh, build new buildings and to start up new programs. And so happy to say that uh, I will be uh, standing along with the commissioners and others to cut the ribbon as we open our Center for Advanced Technologies. It is down uh, at our, our Lower Bucks campus. It is intended to uh, work very closely. We have a very good relationship with CareerLink and uh, some other entities in the lower bucks, but it's really helping us to uh, provide opportunities for individuals who are looking to go directly into the career, uh, into a career or the workforce. And so it is a, um, you can go to the next slide um, and the next one. Um, it is, it is a, a facility that we hope will have a level of uh, versatility um, and be agile so that we can move programs around um, and not necessarily have one particular space only for one type of program. So we're very excited about that. 
we hope to be able to uh, open those doors um, at the end of May, barring any more construction material delays. So uh, that, is, that is our goal, to be open uh, May uh, of this year. Next slide, please. Um, so what you also um, may or may not know is that we, we partner with 70 plus manufacturing companies. Uh, we have ample facilities for community groups. We encourage those who are looking for a place for their reorganizations to meet. If you would like to use one of our facilities, please do that. Um, we are working very closely with our hospitals and healthcare industry. Uh, I have uh, meetings with quite a few people who say, hey, we need nurses, we need LPNs, we need CNAs. Uh, and I say, yes, and we're going to get them to you, right? And so that's the work that we're doing. Um, one of the things that I love about this area is that everybody loves bucks. And I love bucks too. But I think our alumni and our donor network really has shown that. It's more than just saying, we like bucks, we love Bucks County Community College, but it's putting money and support behind that particularly for student scholarships, because I want to make sure that any person that comes to us who has a dream, a goal, that financing it is not the barrier, all right? And finally, employment services. Again, uh, our COO has worked very closely with making sure that CareerLink works with us. Uh, we're working with United Way. We're working with um, other entities in the community to make sure that we have employment services and that we have career training that fits what those needs are. Next slide, please. So uh, people say, well, what are you doing here, Felicia? What, what is it? Now, and these are three themes, right? These three themes are enrollment, because we want to increase enrollment, two, engagement, meaning that you see me in the community, you see our employees in the community, and we are also engaging our students, and that we create a culture of care, right? Because everybody, regardless of where uh, they are affiliated. They want to know that the people that work there care about them. And so those are the three things. Next slide. So again, we want to get to our 2019 enrollment. These are the three charges that I've given to uh, the college community. We want to attain the students we have. We want to reclaim the students we lost. We lost a lot of students in COVID. Uh, and we want to recruit the students who need us most. I worked outside of Chicago uh, proper in Illinois in the richest county in the state of Illinois. And I understand that there are some families who say, the community college is great, but I want my son or daughter to go here. Or I have a legacy at this particular university, and I want them to go there. And that's great. I want you to send your son or daughter there. But there is a significant number of students, and I'll show you percentages, that are not going anywhere. And those are the students that need us the most. Next slide. And then uh, fish philosophy. So I don't know if any of you have seen me on TikTok. I am now famous. I don't know if you all know that. <laughs> right? I can't dance. Like, I go, I go to the NAC and I get into those dance classes so I can have at least three moves, three new moves a month. Um, but, but a lot of that is the fish philosophy. And I bring this up because I want people to understand why am I so energetic and charismatic. Uh, because we've got to choose our attitude, right? We, we want to make sure that people uh, 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 are connected with us, right? We got to be there, present with people. We got to make their day, and we got to have some fun with it, right? And that's why I do those TikToks, because I want students to be like, hey, are you my president? I am. Are you going to join me in the next TikTok? Okay. So we, we have the fish philosophy in order to do engagement. Next slide, please. Now, um, one of the other issues that is of importance to me is making sure that we have access, affordability, and equity. We want to make sure that all residents of the county have the same opportunity, and those who may need a little bit more, we're going to provide them with a little bit more in order for them to have an equitable outcome. And so we are noticing that our students of color, in particular, are having some issues with, number one, graduating from high school, number two, getting into college, number three, persisting and graduating. And so we are going to be working on that to ensure that all residents within the county have the same opportunities. Next slide. And here's one thing that I wanted to show you. Right? On average, in the state of Pennsylvania, 45% of high school seniors are not college bound. Let me, let me say that again. 45%. Now, I just took a few. Just as you can see, 
the number of grads, and the percentage of them who are not going anywhere. Right? Those are the students that need us the most. Next slide. So, leading with a culture of care. We know that the pandemic has been uh, um, catastrophic for many people, uh, but we want to make sure that we are providing as many resources, services, and supports to students and to our employees and to the community. And we are very grateful uh, to the county for, for partnering with, with us and for providing us with the things that we need that we hope will help students and their families. So we have a basic needs website. Um, if you just type in basic needs, when you get into the bucks.edu website, you'll find basic needs. We encourage anyone to use it because it is a resource that we have vetted, uh, and we want to make sure that people know what services are available to them in the community. We also have student mental health and suicide prevention and a Bucks care team. So we want to make sure that we are creating a culture of care as we're supporting students. Next slide, please. So um, when I present, I always like to kind of end with what does the partnership between the county and the college? And, and all that is is equaling that we're improving Bucks. Number one, we want to make sure that access and affordability to college uh, is important. Dual enrollment is important, particularly for students who may not see college as a path. Identifying funding and scholarships to make sure that financing a college degree is not a barrier. Co-branding and collaborating and informing the county about educational opportunities. We are the county's college. And we are in a public college desert. We are the only public institution in this county. And it takes one hour and 30 minutes each way for a student to go to another public institution from the county of Bucks. So we are here to support you and to serve you. Second, creating a culture of care. We want to make sure that whatever we are providing to the county, to the students, to the families, that they know that we genuinely care about them and we care about their entire lives. Many institutions get it wrong because we only are concerned about what's in it for us. That means you come to school, take our classes, and then you pay us. But I want to say we care about the whole student. I want to create a promise for every student that whatever your goal or dream is, you do what we tell you to do. That's the part that most people don't want to do. You do what we tell you to do. But we will guarantee that you will get to your goal or intended dream, whether it's to transfer to an institution, where it's to be hired uh, right out of an occupational program. And finally, workforce development. That's the biggest area, and again, the CEO and I, uh, we've, we've hit it off really well, but this is the area that's so important. Because everywhere I go, I'm, I'm like mid-scoop, and someone says, I saw you on the Bucks County Today online. Wow, that was a great article. I need employees, right? And I say, okay, we'll help you. But it takes more than just us. It takes all of us together in order to raise up the people to where they want to be. Because the, 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 the honest thing is, is that folks want a better living wage and a better experience between the balance of working and life. And I believe that Bucks County Community College can be the place for that. And so I think I'm done. Let's see, let's hit it one more time. Boom, yes. This is a place, Bucks is a place where every educational goal or desire can come to fruition. Bucks is where dreams are realized. And you will hear me say that. You come hang out with me, you will hear me talk about dreams. Because I don't know about you, when I grew up, I had a dream. And my dream was to make sure that my, my parents and my grandparents, who helped me to be who I am today, would never have to want for a thing. And so I want to make sure that any other person that comes within the sphere of Bucks County Community College, who has a dream, a goal, that we realize that. And we cannot do that without our commissioners. And so we thank you so much for your continued support. CO, we thank you so much for your continued support. I am so happy and honored to be here today. And I think the last one just kind of shows, it's a nice glossy picture of me. Uh, 
And our board chair, I would like to honor our board chair uh, for the work that we've done. And please, if there's anything that we could ever do, please do not hesitate to reach out to us and we will respond. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's not hard to see why Dr. Ganther was, uh, you know, hired for the job. <laughs> um, so thank you for coming up. I hope the uh, ride home is a little bit easier than the ride up here. Uh, before we get to the public comments and agenda items, just one uh, thing to note on the agenda itself, on the consent agenda, item 10B is going to be removed. Item 10B under general services, that will be removed from the agenda. All right. So public comments on agenda items. Uh, we have Mr. Andy Warren. morning and uh, welcome to y'all, to you all. Um, the, uh, at one point, Bucks County Community College by, pop, by student population was the 10th largest educational institution in Pennsylvania. Uh, if there's any correlation between student population and enthusiasm by a president, Bucks County's on its way to break the 10 to the top 10 easy. Um, that's, yeah, she was, she was good. Um, <clears throat> two, well now I guess, I had three, I think two now. Um, questions about agenda items. Uh, item number 6A, 6G, I did have a question about 10B, but I assume that's, that's awesome. for another time. So we think on the same page here. Um, item 6A, I don't want you to change your mind on this, but I think uh, your choice of the chaplain for the community, for the um, prison will be, is excellent. I know the chaplain, she's very, and her family, they're very well, and she has done well in the last year, and it will be a good choice. Um, and item 6 a, um, I guess that's the, one, that's the one I just spoke to, item 6G. Um, what was the original contract um, value um, for the fire alarm system? Uh, the extension looks to be a quarter of a million dollars for a year. What was the original contract? Um, that and 10, or that's, I guess that is the extent of this one. I did have a question about the next section, which I'll wait till the end, assuming I'm still here. Um, 6G, I guess. What, what was the original what, what was the okay. original contract? Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so I don't know if um, who might have that, if that's something Mr. Gratz has. Mr. Spencer, I think you'll see him looking at his phone or got a lot of people who might be able to answer that question. Question, what was the original? Yeah, the, the, original, the original contract amount may not be on here, but the, the amount of the present contract is 629997 uh, the increase is two hundred and sixty-seven thousand nine hundred dollars. Thirty percent. So uh, there was a lot of back and forth with um, the design team on this, the uh, construction management firm, as well as uh, Honeywell. Honeywell's under a separate contract for the fire alarm system and some other uh, building systems with the prison directly on uh, these projects. Um, the way the system was designed, it was designed as a delegated design. Uh, essentially, there was, you know, the, the main key components of the fire alarm system are, are, are included as part of the design that goes out to bid. Uh, ultimately, um, the, uh, when the final 
design, you know, the final bids came in, the submittals were accepted for the actual devices and the air handlers and everything. There's some slight, you know, differences between the original um, products as well as what was actually going to be required for the fire alarm system to cover. There's just essentially additional smoke dampers, additional uh, devices needed for the, the smoke evacu evacuation systems that are all part of this. So what this represents is essentially additional uh, relay devices that are required. Um, the initial proposal that came back um, when this first came in from Honeywell was well over $400,000. $400, um, we were able to, with our, with our teams, kind of review that, verify the actual amounts of the additional wire, additional devices, and, not, and, and trim that all the way down to exactly what was, you know, what was just needed. So this number represents a much, you know, the actual number of the amount of additional work, additional labor, additional cabling for these extra devices that are relative to ultimately the, that were unanticipated as part of that delegated design. There were additional devices that ended up being needed, but they're necessary relative to the ultimate code and operations of the, the smoke systems, the fire alarm systems, and the smoke evacuation systems as part of the new prison. So, okay. Thank you. Any board comment or questions? All right, thank you, Mr. Spencer. Appreciate that. Okay, uh, that was the only public comment on agenda items. Uh, so the consent agenda, again, minus 10B, uh, would be approval of the minutes from December 15th, 2021, as well as resolutions 1 through 17F. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay, so we'll now move to regular agenda. <clears throat> Item 18 uh, is approved uh, resolution ratifying and confirming restating declaration of disaster emergency of December 29th, 2021 through, through January 31st, 2022, relative to increased response required for COVID variants. Um, this is uh, something that came out of uh, some communications that the county had with um, the hospital network uh, here, the six hospitals uh, and their um, kind of need for testing as well as the desire of the county to be, to be able to have testing to support um, our school districts as well as our own staff in terms of testing for COVID. Um, a bidding process, as you can imagine, would take several months. Uh, and so you know, this is obviously a situation with cases being as high as they are, uh, where an emergency declaration would assist the county in being able to purchase tests uh, more rapidly and get them uh, where they need to be uh, as quickly as we could. Um, any comments or questions from board members about 18? Okay. All right. Um, we'll do these one at a time here. Um, is there a motion then to approve 18A? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 19. Courts, Children, Youth Conflict Council. Uh, the court system here in Bucks County. Oh, oh. Go ahead, Mr. Eichmann. I'll let you talk a little bit. Good morning, Commissioner. Uh, Stephen Heckman on behalf of uh, Judge Bateman, uh, President Judge, asking for the uh, board's approval of the appointment of three attorneys uh, for the, to serve as Dependency Conflict Council. They're appointed when there's a conflict that arises for the, between legal aid and the representation of the parents. The um, the salaries involved are, are a fixed amount and very budget friendly. So if there were, in case there weren't any, the courts would have to approve of uh, attorneys to handle the position. But this keeps budget cost in, in, in line um, so we don't have to worry about where that's going. Um, this is a follow up to the board's approval previously of the five other uh, dependency conflict council uh, back on December 15th. And I would ask that your consideration, based on the fact that they do um, are usually represent over, are involved in a total of over 100 cases over the course of a year. And um, I think they, they do a good job. They're all, these are all returning a conflict counsel. And as a result, we would seek your approval. Okay. And just for <clears throat> information for the public, there are two different lists of conflict councils, so criminal and uh, dependency. And for the same reasons as you stated, uh, if someone is a, given a public defender but there's a conflict, you have, a you have criminal conflict list as well. 
That's true. If, uh, conflict in the criminal end would be with the public defender's office and the independency, and it would be with the uh, legal aid. Uh, any other questions, Mr. Heckman? I have a question. Well, actually, it's more of a comment. I think, you know, we've been trying to, to deal with the fact that you have some people, I guess it's just these three, who are on both the conflict list for children and youth as well as the conflict list for criminal. And I've had just a couple concerns about that. First of all, there is a million lawyers, it seems like, in this county, and many have told me that they'd be very interested in this. So I'm not sure why we don't go out and kind of look and maybe do some interviews. But more importantly, if you add the salary that people who are being duplicative and being on both lists are, they're making more than our public defender and our district attorney, and that's just not right. So I'm going to vote for this today, but once again, I'm, I'm going to say I'm not going to vote for it next year unless we start to see just one. They've got to pick one list or the other list. That's it. So uh, just for clarification, um, you said the fee, obviously they're, they're paid a certain amount of fee. You know, dependency, they're given about a little under $25,000. Criminal conflict list, they get about f a little over $41,000. That's correct. Um, are they, is that, that's just a standard fee. They're, are they paid by hours? Do they have to track hours? Or they just, they just get that money? Oh, no, it's standard, and they just get that money. It depends. They could have uh, cases that would, an hourly rate would go much higher than that if they bill at an hourly rate. Uh, obviously, with COVID, we've had some issues where there have been less cases, but we think that's a savings to the county. Okay. Um, and both those rates, I should say, have been up, you know, were, were increased, um, you know, a 9% increase in the rates for dependency and 6% increase for criminal. Um, I do agree. I mean, obviously, we, we have, you know, even just in the room here, we've got quite a few attorneys. Uh, you know, so I, I, I'm sure there are attorneys that we could. We wouldn't have to have people on both lists. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I know it was something that, um, you know, <clears throat> I think you yourself had even asked the COO for some assistance in finding people. <clears throat> I mean, I'm obviously, you know, we need the conflict lists, uh, so I'm, I'll be voting in favor of this. But, um, I mean, I also would think we could probably find other people uh, to, to fill these roles so we don't have people who are getting money from both lists. But. <clears throat> Understood. We do have, I mean, these people have done a good job that are returning, and we do advertise when there is an opening. So we are okay. always looking for uh, individuals who are interested in serving on either list. Okay. Well, we're, um, well this might be a good advertisement. So come next, uh, you know, October or November or so, we, you know, we might be getting a lot more, lot more interest in, in, in those lists. So... Um, if no more comments or questions, is there a motion for 19A? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank, Thank you, Director. <clears throat> right. Item 20 has four parts. Uh, a is approving a lease agreement to allow use of space at the Warwick Shopping Square Shopping Center for Public Vaccination Administration uh, from January 1st, 2022 to September 30th, 2022. Um, item B is approved an extension of the site agreement to allow the use of the facility at the Shamani Mall for public vaccination from January 1st, 2022 to June 30th, 2022. C is approved purchase of COVID-19 antigen home test kits. D is to approve purchase of COVID-19 antigen test kits for county um, schools and non-vaccinated county employees. Um, I think when I ask um, Audrey Kenny, our emergency uh, management director, talk a little bit about our vaccination program, we did sort of, we're, we're transitioning in a way and uh, adding a site and changing some hours uh, and also how we've been doing over the past year. So it's been a strong year, 2021. We were able to provide 195,000 vaccines at our uh, five clinics throughout the year. We are transitioning starting next week. Our clinics will reopen um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at Warwick. It's at a new site in that same shopping center. It's the former Pet Value Store. Um, they've been setting that up all week and getting ready to go. The Nishamani site will be open Tuesdays and Thursdays uh, in the same place as it was before in the old H&M store inside the Nishamani Mall. We are also introducing a site back in Upper Bucks at the Perkasie campus of the Bucks County Community College. That'll be open on Tuesdays from 10 to 2. We have a mobile uh, clinic opportunity available as well. We've been doing a lot of outreach with our um, vulnerable populations and our treatment facilities to make sure that we're taking care of residents as they, can, as they need to. Um, and also working with our, um, within our county infrastructure to make sure our staff gets boosters as necessary. 
we're able to take care of Pfizer, Moderna, or Johnson & Johnson as needed. Um, we've had some really strong days. We've had people already walking into Warwick this week looking to get vaccines. We're, we're not quite ready um, to use that site just yet. Dr. Damsker was going to have an opportunity to go out and take a look at it, make sure it was set properly. Um, but we're ready to go um, with vaccines starting next week. Okay. And we are also reaching out. I think we're doing boosters to some of the homebound people we reached we out to. We've been working with the area agency on aging as their resident or their um, clients have been um, contacting them. And we're um, looking to secure home tests to be able to provide to offset some of the stresses that are happening. There's been a high demand for um, home test kits or, or test kits in general. Um, so we're hoping to provide some relief there. Okay. All right. Thank you. Other questions from Ms. Kenny? No. no. Okay. Is there a motion then for item 20, A, B, C, and D? So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Item 21 uh, is with the Treasurer's Office, approve appointment of a project administrator in conjunction with the county's implementation of the CPACE program. Ms. Ballerini? You're off. <laughs> Do you want to go to the podium? Ah. There you go. We're alive. So yes, um, this is the final piece of formalizing the CPACE, CPACE program that we instituted last year, which is to name SEF, which stands for Sustainable Energy Fund, as the administrator of the plan. And I'm learning in this building and sometimes in life that good things take time, right? And in this case, the time means that we're doing it right and we're doing it well. So for commercial property investors looking to improve properties with sustainable and environmentally conscious additions or our builds, SEF is gonna to act to assist in securing the funding and reviewing the plans for those applicants that apply to do it. Um, my office then will work with the local tax collectors in those municipalities with assessing the annual payment for those projects. I'm excited about this project in particular um, because we've already seen interest and inquiries coming through. And I myself have been involved in some discussions with some leaders around the county who are looking to make these advancements, right? But I also sit on the in-house committee for the Ready for 100 plan that we have here where we actively are looking for ways within the buildings here to be more energy efficient and to reduce our impact on the environment. So that, along with the implementation of the CPACE program, are really forward-thinking plans that have two resounding messages. One is it's showing that we have responsible stewardship of where we live and work. And two, it supports and prioritizes our commitment to improving the communities around us with revitalization. So I just, I love that. So when you couple those two things that we're doing with, I'm fortunate enough to sit on the retirement board. Um, we've made some decisions, um, some investment decisions with our ESG investing. We got word last week when we went with our fund manager that those funds are performing very well. So we've done that and it's proving to show its return, right? So we have taken steps that are innovative, that are forward thinking, but more importantly, it shows that we're dedicated to the overall well-being of everyone in the county. And of that, I'm very proud. Thank you. Questions for Ms. Ballerini? No, thank you. Thank you. I do, I do just want to add, Chris, um, that recently the legislature um, passed uh, including residential properties. Oh, my gosh. So that's, 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 that's a plus. And yeah. you know, I'm a big proponent. I, I want to are. see this in the agricultural world as well. <laughs> I really want to see the farmers that we have in Bucks County, because that's such a large part of our community. I would love to see them to be able to take advantage of yeah. this as yeah, well. Yeah. It's yeah. innovative financial funding, and we like that in my office. <laughs> Other questions? And SEF, I believe, handles most of the counties that have gone with the CPACE program, do they not? Yeah. Okay. All right, is there a motion then to approve the appointment of the project administrator, on item 21? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, workforce development. Um, 
two items, A and B. First, approve the list of businesses uh, and nonprofits to be awarded funds in phase two of the Bucks County Business Recovery Grant Program funded by the American Rescue Plan, ARPA, subject to final approval by the county. Uh, we are going to do one of these businesses separately. Um, uh, Shear Style Incorporated um, is a recipient, uh, and it uh, is uh, owned by uh, Commissioner Deidre Alamo's sister. Uh, and so we're breaking that one out just so um, he's able to vote on the overwhelming majority of them um, without having conflict of interest. And then, obviously, we'll, we'll vote on the second one. He'll be able to abstain. So, um, Ms. McKevin, you want to comment on this? Cut that on. Uh, what I would say is I, I want to thank the Workforce Development Board and the Economic Development Agencies for working on uh, the, the grant applications, as well as our internal staff uh, in finance, controllers, and treasury. I know it's been a, a long journey, but we'll get there and we'll, we'll get these checks out to the businesses as quick as, quick as we can. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, any other questions regarding a and number uh, 22 A and B? Okay. Do, make a motion. Can we vote motion. on these sep separately, oh, yeah, uh, Mr. Yep. Chairman? Make yep. a motion on, uh, does anyone make a motion on 22A? So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion okay. for 22B to be approved. All right. And I'll second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, could, could I comment? Not some, I apologize. Sure. Sure. Can I comment? On, I, I just want to just want to let everybody know and state for the record because I think it's appropriate. My, my sister, Joanne, owns a business, she's a hairdresser, uh, has been in business for a long time. I have absolutely no interest at all uh, in the business and certainly did not play a part in any way in making the decisions for her or for anybody else to get a grant. So I just wanted to state that for the record and I think it would be appropriate to recluse myself or abstain on the vote. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Um, all right, so we, did, we voted, right? Yeah, all in favor? Yeah, we did. Okay. You made the abstention. All right, thank you. Okay. Um, for uh, personnel actions, just a note um, that there are, a, there's an update from uh, what was posted yesterday. Some of the compensation rates uh, did not reflect the uh, cost of living increase, specifically numbers 11, 12, 14, 16, 18, uh, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 25, 27, 28. Uh, on the row list, numbers 10, 11, 12, and 14. Um, they'll be, hmm? the, the, um, the list that's in the back here is actually one that, that is uh, accurate, so I apologize for the mistake. Um, with that amended kind of uh, list, uh, is there a motion to approve the personnel actions? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, board appointments. Uh, board members can see the list of appointments. Um, I'm trying to find my list now. So, um, Airport Authority, Mr. Stephen Lindruth. Um, the, do these all at once if that's okay? Mm -hmm. Objection to that? No, that's fine. Um, back in the fall, the uh, Bucks County approved its own creation of a, what's called America 250 PA Committee. Uh, this is uh, following in line with the Pennsylvania America 250 Committee. Uh, this is uh, designed to start getting ready and preparing for the 250th uh, birthday of the country in uh, 2026. Uh, and so um, we have a, uh, we're going to have a board that's going to be 15 members. Um, these are, as you can see, the beginnings of that. Um, we have representatives from um, the Bucks County Intermediate Unit. Uh, we have some educators. We have uh, Paul Botsvengo from Visit Bucks County, Linda Sally from the American, African American History Museum. Kyle McCoy from the Bucks County Historical Society, um, as well as, uh, and we'll be looking for some others, people, we're not done yet, but um, I'll make a motion to appoint those uh, individuals, as well as five members to the area in Zion Aging, um, Michael Bannon, uh, Yang Nishchaksi, James Kelly, Barbara Mentor, Robert Silberg, 
Bucks County Opportunity Council, Constance Furman, Industrial Development Authority, Stephen Marzullo, to the MHDP, Diana Kelly, Planning Commission, Mr. James Miller, Judy Reese, Dave Nyman, St. Mary Hospital Authority, James McCaffrey, to the Water and Sewer Authority, George Hutt. I'll make those in the form of a motion. Second. All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Other civics, um, do we have uh, the Christmas Gala for $1,500, Dual Town Fisher for $1,500. Um, Bucks County, we do typically make donations to Animal Lifeline and the Bucks County SPCA. Uh, at some point during the year, um, those of you who were fans of uh, the late Betty White uh, will note that there's been sort of a focused campaign on the, um, through social media since she was a very, very big animal rights advocate for people in her memory to make donations to uh, organizations that take care of animals. So it made sense, uh, given her recent passing, to do donations to Animal Lifeline for 1,000 and Bucks County SPCA for 5,000 at this meeting, um, you know, because it kind of fits in line with what everybody else seems to be doing. So um, any, uh, is there a motion to that effect? So moved. Second? Second. All, right, all in favor? Aye. 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 <clears throat> all right, Chief Operating Officer Report. Ms. McKevitt. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, first, I just wanted to say congratulations to our newly elected row officers and, and welcome. I look forward to working with you. Let us know if there's anything that you need uh, with your transition and we're happy to, happy to help. Um, and then second, there were two uh, employees on our personnel list that are going to be leaving us um, and for, for retirement. Um, and I, I just wanted to make note of both of them uh, one is, is departing this week. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you came to us from Delaware Valley College. Is that right? Yes. Chris? Yes. <laughs> um, Chris Daly has been with us for about 14 years. Um, and we want to thank you for um, keeping our, our county facilities safe from Zarm's Way uh, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, and you have uh, really brought the county security department to a level, um, the highest level of professionalism, um, and we appreciate that. So thank you. Um, and then Maureen, our great softball player from the Commission Impossible. <laughs> I, I, um, I think you have, I know you have been here longer than I have, um, and I, don't, I won't say how long. <laughs> um, but thank you. You, you, you protect us. Um, you have helped us through many difficult times, uh, most recently COVID. And we can't thank you enough for all that you've done. She, uh, I know you're not leaving till March, so hopefully you will impart your, your purchasing, um, what should I say? Uh, <laughs> expertise and uh, right um, and 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 port that to the next person that um, comes in for us so thank you and that that concludes my report for today thank you solicitor's report thank you commissioner um, I also would uh, like to congratulate our new row officers I also look um, forward to working with not only you but also your solicitors on any needs that you may have um, I also um, want to congratulate uh, Commissioners uh, Deidre Alamo and Commissioners Harvey on their new positions today. Um, and also um, uh, give my personal thanks to Commissioner Marseglia um, for your leadership for these last two years, um, which has been an incredibly difficult time for everyone. And, um, and having you lead us uh, through these times has been um, very much appreciated by all of us. So thank you, Commissioner. Um, with that, um, I just report out on our executive sessions um, in the county. Um, we traditionally have one the day before the public meeting uh, that occurred yesterday um, when the commissioners met with staff and legal counsel to receive information on a variety of items of county business and to uh, discuss uh, personnel and employment matters, uh, collective bargaining matters, uh, pending litigation, as well as emergency preparedness uh, in dealing with the, um, uh, the latest variant of COVID. Um, and uh, uh, just uh, uh, the, the prior week, uh, as the commissioners just uh, voted to ratify um, and adopt, uh, the commissioners had to meet uh, between the 29th and 30th of December in order to um, deal with the, the uh, emerging emergency and help the county uh, prepare and sign and execute the declaration of disaster emergency. And that completes my report. Okay, thank you. 
Any comments or questions for the solicitor? Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, public comments. This is on all items. Um, Patricia Dobler. Sorry, I had to pivot there a little bit. Happy New Year. Patricia Dobler, Chalfant. Commissioners, there has been talk of unity and coming together here at these meetings. Personally, I would love to see both sides working together. I'm afraid that private and public messaging do not match up, however. And I think accountability is important, especially since our county is experiencing a wave of new Republican row office heads, and the commissioners have stoked hate and division. In an email obtained through Right to Know, Commissioner Marseglia said the following about Charlie Martin, former county commissioner and current president of Centennial School Board. Former Commissioner Charlie Martin, I served with him for 12 years. He's just trying to get people upset and is best ignored. It is a little odd, but after retiring as commissioner for 20 years, he ran and won for school board in 2019. He is a right-wing Republican, supported Trump. Commissioner Marseglier, I think you need to add Mr. Martin to your ever-growing list of people in this county you need to apologize to. I really hope this isn't how you speak about Commissioner DiGirolamo or your new row heads. But he is, the other commissioners, excuse me, Commissioner DiGirolamo is never copied on your most contentious emails. So I hope this isn't how you talk about them too. Stop the hate, stop the mockery, and take accountability for your politically motivated actions. Also, did you just put us back into a state of an emergency? Is this to make it easier for schools to go virtual again? Have our children not been punished enough? And you backdated it to December 29th when all the county clinics were closed? What are we doing? Is that just to throw it under the rug? We're watching. Okay, Jamie Walker. If one school goes virtual, it's because these three just put our county back into an emergency. It's ridiculous. And they did it, they snuck it in. Newly elected officials, I want to make you aware of the corruption that has taken place over the past five months to our health department that continues to hurt thousands of children. There was an email sent from the local Democrat executives on August 20th, 2021 to Commissioner Harvey and Commissioner Marseglia, subject, Damsker. In that email, these political donors asked Commissioner Marseglia to fire Dr. Damsker, a county employee. I quote, as an employee of the county, it is, is it not your prerogative to relieve him of his duties? If this is something you should do, you should, you should do it. We are hopeful you consider our request. Obviously, letting someone go is no small matter. Commissioner Marseglia responds, is it possible to set up a Zoom call with all you? I need to clear things up, and I cannot use these emails my email. The Zoom call happened. Then on 8, August 23rd, new school reopening guidance was sent to our 13 counties, our 13 superintendents that affected the lives of 80,000 children and all of their family. Healthy children are still being sent home in this county and they are unlawfully being forced to be masks, all because a bunch of politicians decided to play doctor with our children. The people on all these emails use their political power to hurt children, try to hurt my children, and to try to get Commissioner Marseglia to fire an employee for any, anyone else that works here. I am calling for a full investigation into what happened in August. We have enough emails to prove that Diane Marseglia has been silencing our health director, she's been playing doctor for our kids, you made the, the county support a mask mandate that was illegal. You supported TDC guidelines that was wrong. And now you just put our county back into an emergency to help the teachers union. Megan Brock. Ms. Megan Brock. I wanted to start by sharing a statement from CBS News reporter Jan Crawford. When asked what was the most underreported news story of 2020, uh, 2021, she stated, the crushing impact of our COVID policies have had on young children and kids. We have the Surgeon General saying there's a mental health crisis among our kids. The risk of suicide attempts among girls is now up 51% this year. Black kids are nearly twice as likely as white kids to die by suicide. School closures, lockdowns, cancellation of sports, tremendous negative impact on kids. It's all been an afterthought. It's hurt their dreams, their future, learning loss, risk of abuse, and their mental health. 
Now it appears that today you just voted to say we've been in a state of emergency since December 29th, 2021. How do, you, how do you backdate a state of emergency? If there's an emergency, wouldn't you need to declare that on the actual date? Can you please clarify that? Secondly, why have you not alerted the public that we're in a state of emergency? I would assume that if we're in a state of emergency, that's something the public should know, right? Does anyone, anyone disagree with that in this room? Thirdly, did you do this? just to inflict that harm that I just spoke about on children. I'm sure you're aware that there are a lot of school board meetings happening this week. Yesterday, a school board just passed a really great plan that's going to stop eradicating this harm that's been done to children. Now, if anyone in the room is not aware of why school districts have the ability to go to virtual learning, it's because of something called the 520.1 change in the school code. By putting this state of emergency in, it appears that you're trying to give boards runway to then go to virtual learning, even though it hurts children. This is unacceptable. Unacceptable. Stop it. Vanna Diarmond. I'm going to echo what the previous speakers had said. Someone please explain to me, I'm not gonna assume, but why has the state of emergency been backdated? Why wasn't it done on the date that you're saying that we got into a state of emergency? Uh, why, why haven't testing sites been open if this is really an emergency? Why were we not known, let, why wasn't the public told about this? If this is truly a state of emergency and it's needed, then I would expect to see some kind of announcement to the public. Um, also, I am wondering about the motivation behind this and how it's going to affect school children, my school children, other school children. We talk so much about mental health. We cannot go back to virtual. It's not necessary. And I really hope that you will answer these questions that we have the right to know process is there to hold our elected officials accountable. So we're not coming up here criticizing you because we're mean. We want answers. We want you to govern us, not politically. What's best for the people isn't the political party saying, do this, do that. We have the, we have the emails. We see that that was the case. We need to let Dr. Damskrip get back to doing what he does best, being a public health doctor without political pressure. The CDC is wrong again, and now they've changed their guidance, and guess what? They're following Dr. Damsker's guidance. Please speak to us about this. Answer our questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Those are all names on the list. Um, Mr. Kahn, I'll turn to you to explain the, um, oh, Mr. Warren. Go ahead, Mr. Warren. I have the utmost respect for the position that you all hold. And I think probably similar to the <laughs> previous speakers, I believe that you have ability to enact actions. I also believe that you and I are on the same level regarding drugs in this country um, and um, COVID spreading. Therefore, I ask very sincerely, not grandstanding at all, do any of you know whether or not people who illegally cross our southern border are being brought in to Bucks County. Last night, there was a night flight, as I understand it, to Scranton, where many of those people were um, brought somewhere. I'm asking, as the leaders of Bucks County, do you know, or perhaps the district attorney know, whether or not people are being housed in Bucks County who may or may not have ever had a COVID 
shot. Um, we ought to know, we know for a fact they aren't happening, or yeah, it is, and we know they're okay. I also ask that you, in your position as commissioners, pen a letter to the State Association of County Commissioners asking that the federal government enact and force and look to what is hap not happening at our southern border regarding illegal crossings. You, again, I respect your position. I absolutely believe that you are the leaders of this county, and I too am asking as such, take action on me. Thank you, Mr. Warren. Um, with regard to the question about the state of emergency, I'll turn to the solicitor who explained the process. Sure, thank you, Commissioner. Um, so Pennsylvania has what's called the Emergency Management Services Act. Um, it's in Title 55 of uh, the Pennsylvania Code. Um, and that lays out all the protocols that allow a governing body, such as the Board of Commissioners, which don't meet every day uh, with public meetings, but actually meet about twi twice a month, to be able to take the measures that are necessary if there's something that happens on an emergency basis, like declaring an emergency. Um, this is exactly what the county went through when we first were hit with COVID uh, at the very beginning of uh, 2020. And uh, that didn't, um, when it became apparent that emergency measures were gonna need, need to happen, uh, that didn't line up neatly with the day that the commissioners had to get an agenda out and then have a public meeting. And so what they did then, which is what happened at the end of um, uh, last calendar year, um, is they uh, signed as authorized under uh, section 7501 of that act, um, the declaration of a, a disaster emergency. Um, the day that that happened on uh, so the 29th, um, uh, that, that that became effective uh, within I believe 24 hours, that was posted to the county website. It has been there ever since. Um, if anyone here has already gone to the county website, um, among other places perhaps, it is on the section where when you look to see the list of all the Board of Commissioner meetings and the agendas and so forth, it is literally right there at the top with a hyperlink and you can read line by line every word of that authorization that contains um, the signatures of the commissioners. Um, what the, um, and, and you'll see that is not an ongoing emergency that is simply declared for uh, just over one month and it expires on the date that, that, that appears in the agenda. Um, what the act also contemplates is that, um, that the public body, in this case, the Board of Commissioners, will meet in public. And when they do that, um, uh, what is contemplated is that they will vote to do what the agenda here says, to ratify, confirm, and restate that declaration um, so that um, what happened outside the presence of the public can then happen again with public comment, with everyone having a chance to, to speak their mind, uh, and for that to be then part of the resolution that would be signed at the end of the meeting. Okay, thank you. And I'll just kind of echo my comments when we actually voted on it, which was that uh, this was something that came out of discussions we had with our hospitals uh, in this county. They were being overwhelmed um, by uh, patients and by requests for tests and the need for the county uh, to assist them and make sure that we could uh, allocate that and get, that, uh, get those resources to them as quickly as possible. Um, okay, we are looking at commissioner comment. Uh, Mr. or Commissioner DiRalmo. Thank you. Uh, uh, my, my, my family uh, suffered a tragedy uh, this past week, uh, the death of my sister. And I, I'd like to thank everybody, uh, many of them in this room, for their kind words or cards or emails or text messages, uh, cards, flowers. Uh, thank you very much. It, it's very, very much appreciated and very comforting. Uh, she died in a car accident last Tuesday. Uh, you know, it's just, just a tragedy. Um, so unexpected. Uh, I know probably most of you didn't know my sister. I, it, while I was sitting here, I received an email from a, a resident in uh, Ben Salem where I live. And my sister's name was Janice. And 
the person says Janice was a beautiful person inside and out. And I know you didn't know her, but she was. Um, I remember the day she was born. I was five years older. And uh, we lived with my grandparents on the farm. And I remember coming down in the morning and my dad being there and telling me and my younger sister, Joanne, that, you know, you have a baby sister. Back then, you know, people didn't know whether they were going to have a boy or a girl. And uh, I can remember the first time I saw her because when my mom went home from the hospital, uh, she went over down her mom's house to stay for a couple days while she was recuperating. And I remember my dad uh, taking me down to the house and, and seeing her for the first time. Um, she graduated from Holy Family University with a degree in teaching, and she could have gone into teaching, but she decided that she wanted to work on the farm as well as me, and we had a uh, just starting a, a farm market. So she took over as the manager of the farm market, and uh, she worked there, I guess, for almost 40 years in that farm market, and just, I just can remember so many times, I mean, how she just knew everybody that came in. Um, she knew their names, their family's names, their dog's names, what their children were doing. And I mean, she just talked to every person. And how many times when she knew maybe a family was struggling or going through hard times, that and I, and I saw her do it, she would take money out of her back pocket and hand them, hand them money, would go to the register and said, you know, you don't have to pay today, take at home, you know. She, she had a heart of gold. She really did. And on, on Monday when she had her, had her funeral and viewing, I can't tell you how many hundreds of pounds, hundreds of people passed through, and almost to a person, they just had a short story to tell about her, about, you know, how she helped them, or, you know, how she did something for them. And, uh, you know, I, I, I know for sure, like that email, that she was a good person inside and out. And I know she's at peace now, and I know where she's at, and uh, we're all gonna miss her, the family, the community. She just volunteered so much in the church, in the community, over at school, where my kids went to school, at St. Ephraim's, our parish, and uh, she was a good person inside and out. So again, thank you to everybody for your, your kind words and prayers and thoughts. They're very much appreciated, thank you. Commissioner Marsegli. Thank you. Jean, I'm glad that you remembered your sister, and we are all with you. Thank you. Uh, you know, tomorrow is January 6th, and we all know that we had that incident in the Capitol, the insurrection that happened then. And it's been on my mind, not that I want to talk about that, that today, but how something like that could happen. And, and I honestly believe the reason it happened is because people were lied to, they were given information that wasn't true, and they were very angry. And when you continue to lie to people and lie to people, they will get angrier and angrier. And sometimes it completely, in this case, discredited their faith in their very government. And they, that some of those people chose to strike out. And I've been asking myself since then, what could I have done? What could I have done as a county commissioner? And the truth is, there's really nothing I could have done. But what I can do is protect this county from being discredited, from people who come in here and lie from people who make up things and say them because I can't have the people of Bucks County hear lies and lies and lies because eventually they'll start to think that they're true. So a general caution to everyone out there, when you hear people that are saying or posting on Facebook and other social media, things that seem incredulous, don't believe it. There's more to it. If you have a question and it has to do with the county, we're happy to ask about that. When people do that, it is morally wrong, it is ethically wrong, and it is Bucks County wrong. But I am gonna to start to knock them down 
because even though people have advised us, just ignore them, just ignore them when they lie, I'm not going to do that because of what happened in Washington. Back in August, I did get an email from some people who were elected committee people, part of the Democratic Party, and they did ask me to fire Dr. Damsker, which is laughable, because I think he's one of the finest men there are. I believe in him. We would never have fired him. We never discussed it. I believe, even though some people misstate his rules, I believe in everything he said. So I thought, I'm going to meet with these people, and I'm going to explain to them how wrong they are. So they set up a Zoom from one of their homes. And when I went home that night, I met with them. And it was not a good meeting. So I'm just going to tell you, I thought I was going to be able to change their minds, and I couldn't. But that's what happened. But that was a private Zoom meeting I had. I could have done it here in the county, because they are taxpaying citizens who were asking me to do something that I believed was wrong. But I did it on my own time on a private person's Zoom account. And yet some of the people that come to this meeting and speak and speak, hunted down the person whose email that was and emailed them over the holiday, chastising them for their opinion on Dr. Damsker. That isn't what we do in Bucks County. We do not find people's private emails who are not elected officials and say things to them. It gets to the point where people are afraid, and we can't have a county that's afraid because people make up stories. So I just want to say today, I'm not going to be a member of that anymore. I'm not going to allow it. And I'm going to do exactly what, what our college president said to do. I'm going to choose to be president, present, sorry. And I'm going to choose to remember that Bucks is where dreams are realized. This is where dreams are realized. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. I want to echo some of the comments <clears throat> um, of um, our COO, Marge McKevitt. Um, aside from uh, Commissioner Marseglia and um, I think a couple of the row officers at the time, the first, I think, county employee I met after I was elected was Chris Daly, uh, who uh, was gracious enough to um, have myself. Um, I think I brought my wife and, and uh, uh, some of the other row officers were here with their families. Uh, it was like, a, I think, a Saturday or Sunday in November that he you know, came in and just uh, kind of showed us around the building because quite frankly, I, I, had never, I hadn't been in this building very much <laughs> before I was elected. Uh, didn't really know much about it and some of the real officers didn't know anything about it. Um, and you know, he, cer he certainly made a good impression of, of you know, his professionalism and his uh, you know, making us feel welcome. Um, and I, as I come in every morning, I buy, pass by his office and uh, you know, stop in and you know, just say hi and you know, um, Wish him happy birthday in, uh, in, on November, uh, wait, 10th, right? Marine Corps birthday, yeah. <laughs> so um, so I, I, well, uh, I'll miss that time. I'm not sure who's going to be in that office now, but I'll, 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 I'm sure for a while I'm going to stick my head in looking for you and you won't be there. But you certainly earned retirement, um, you know, and, and, and wish you all the best in whatever you choose to do, and you can do whatever you choose to do. <laughs> so that's the best part. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, to Maureen, thank you. And obviously, you have a few more months, uh, you know, but, but uh, you certainly have been, uh, you know, someone who has helped us imme immeasurably through the last couple of years, uh, getting through an unbelievably difficult time. Uh, not just the worst pandemic in the past hundred years, but, uh, you know, certainly tornadoes and, and floods and, you know, uh, we missed out on the locusts and frogs, but um, you know they may still be coming. We don't know it's in the next two months, so hopefully not. But thank you for everything you've done. Um, <clears throat> I did not really know, um, didn't know Commissioner DiGirolamo really at all before um, we started working together two years ago. Uh, I'd met him a handful of times um, in various political events. You know, when I was a supervisor and he was a state rep, um, having you know obviously worked with him very closely over the past two years, I know what kind of human being he is. And so I can only imagine that his sister, um, um, you know, it's possible she's better, a better human being than you. I don't know. It's, you've, you set a pretty high, high bar. So, but, um, you know, certainly the sympathies, you know, of, of myself and my family and Commissioner Marseille and our staff are with you and your family. So, um, and it, Kind of gave me, as you spoke, it kind of gave me sort of something uh, that I was going to be speaking about. Um, we've become, as a country, desensitized. 
And I don't know who the blame goes toward. I mean, it certainly didn't happen yesterday or the day before or year before. Um, we can look certainly at the media. We can look at um, Hollywood. We can look at you know politics and, and, and other sources. But you know, there's been a sort of a, of a, of a crushing effect of dehumanization um, between each other, um, and it's been going on for a while. Uh, and it makes it easy when you dehumanize people to say awful things about them, whether you even know who they are or not, whether you care to find out who they are. Um, it makes it easy just to put people in categories. You know, they're different than me. Um, they have a diff different political party than I am. They're a different religion than I am. They're a different race than I am. They're different whatever. Um, you know, and, and it makes it easier uh, to say uh, the kinds of things that lead to a January 6th. Um, and it's, you know, it's certainly a shame that the, you know, the, the people who need to hear this the most are the people who just don't listen. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, I sometimes feel like I'm, uh, you know, back in the classroom, we always knew who the kids were who weren't listening. Uh, you know, and, and that happens, you know, even, even, even here, no matter what you say, you know, there's people who don't listen. But it doesn't mean you still shouldn't be saying it. It doesn't mean you should stop pointing it out. Um, Sitting here on Monday, you know, sitting out on the floor as the, our new row officers took their oath of office and our, our returning uh, district attorney took his oath of office. Um, they took the same oath that the three commissioners and, and the row officers did um, two years ago, although yours seemed longer than ours. I think it was, <laughs> I don't know. I think uh, we said that to each other afterwards. At some point, adoring, I said, I don't know what, what you know, Judge Bateman, where he found this, but it seems like an awfully long, long, so you had to keep your hand up a lot longer than we did. But, um, you know, we, we took an oath, all of us preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of this Commonwealth, the laws of the county bucks. Um, and I'm sure, you know, all of us take it seriously. It doesn't matter what party we are. It doesn't matter what experience we have. It doesn't matter what agenda we have. We take it seriously. A, somewhere in there inherent in those pledges is to treat people humanely, um, to treat people decently. Um, it is difficult to do that at times, um, but we have to keep doing it. Uh, and I know these elected officials will do it and just as we do it. Um, and we'll lean on each other when it gets hard. Doesn't matter what party, you, you know, the constituents that come to the you know, sheriff's uh, department uh, or recorder of deeds with the same constituents who go to the treasurer's office and the register of wills, um, and eventually, at some point, the coroner's office. <laughs> so, uh, and they're the same constituents we have. So we all serve them, uh, just as the people over here uh, in the jury box uh, serve everybody, regardless of who they are. Um, and so, 2021 was not a fun year for many people, although, you know, certainly some of the you know, our, our newly elected officials certainly had, you know, uh, it, was a good, it was a little bit better for them than some others. Um, in addition, obviously, to Commissioner Deidre Alamo's sister in 2021, we lost hundreds of our own residents to the pandemic. Uh, we lost people toward the end of the year, especially. Tragic fire in Quakertown that killed a father and two sons. Um, pedestrian accidents in different parts of the county who took people's lives. Mr. Marcegui's mother passed away earlier in 2021. Um, and so in memory of those who passed and maybe in thinking about the future, I'm just gonna ask for a moment of silence. Thank you. I thank everybody who put work into making this meeting successful, make it happen. Uh, there's a lot of staff time that goes into this. Um, you know, Kate Saul does a tremendous amount of work on this. And so thank you, uh, Kate, for your, all your work. And um, thank my fellow commissioners again for your confidence in me. And I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion for adjournment. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you.